This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Dyson and Bird are deep. Taken by Neal. He gives it to Wycheck. Wycheck. That looked like a forward pass. Taken by Dyson. We're going back to January 8th, 2020, the Music City Miracle. You hear the call, you automatically remember how that play played out. But that game was actually a little more entertaining going back and watching the full thing. There's a lot more going on storyline-wise in that game than I ever remembered. So I'm glad we went back to watch that for this episode of Distant Replay. I am Ben George. He is Mike Noto. Mike, good to talk to you again. How you doing? I'm doing well, Ben. How are you? I'm doing well as well. 20 years. 20 years since this game happened. And this is one of the epic plays in NFL history. I mean, this is one of the top, I don't know, maybe 10 plays all time in NFL history, this play. And I was surprised going back how much else was going on in this game besides this play. Like everything leading up to this moment, there was so much happening in this game. Yeah, you had storylines galore, subplots galore, and also a lot of legacies altered by this game. And when, you, when I thought of this game, I was like, huh, is this game much more than that one play? And it definitely was, as we'll get to. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to run through it all tonight. We're going to set you up what was important leading into this game. We're going to go through the game um, quarter by quarter. It wasn't the most exciting game, but there was a, there's a lot to talk about over the course of the 60 minutes. And then we'll wrap it all up with some outdated stuff, a lot of outdated stuff actually in this game. Plus, we're going to talk about each of these franchises, what's happened, plus the legacies, as Mike just mentioned, of a bunch of players in this game. Let me first remind you, though, distantreplaypodcast.com is our website. You'll find every past episode. This broadcast that we watched in its entirety, the game as it aired, will be on there, plus all of our old broadcasts that we watch. You can watch them there, archived on our website. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube. Find us in any of those places. And let us know if you have something you want to hear, a game you want us to go back and watch and us talk about. We'd love to hear from you as well. We've had a couple of listener requests so far. They actually turned out to be really good games, so I'm glad they were sent in. All right, so let's dive into this one. January 8th, as I mentioned, 2000. It was 20 years ago. It was uh, right after Y2K, as you pointed out to me, Mike, before we started this. And, you know, you go back to a kind of a different era in time with Jeff Fisher, Wade Phillips, and and, and the end of this, this Bills dynasty. This was a very interesting time in the NFL. Very interesting time. So to put a snapshot on where we were, you're right after the Jim Kelly, John Elway, Dan Marino era, right? Because the, the 98 season was the the second Denver Super Bowl and then Elway retires and we're not yet into the we're at the beginning of the Peyton Manning era and we're not even we haven't even met Tom Brady yet I know. you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. so so we're kind of in between eras of quarterbacks here and, and it made for for a very competitive landscape in the NFL it did indeed and, and we're going to talk about it all tonight so let's hop into this one a couple things it's important to know going into this game. What's so important leading into this kickoff? This was the first playoff game of this season. Um, a couple of things that I thought was very interesting going back and looking at, Mike. The Titans came in as a wild card. The Titans' record that year was 13-3. and They had they were tied for the second best record in all of the NFL, and they were a wild card. That's crazy. That happens every now and again, right, where you get that 13-3 and team you know, hosting the wild card game. When you look at the divisions, too, by the way, you go back to this. This was, uh, you go back to AFC Central. So the Colts weren't in the division yet, but this is when you had the Jaguars really good. The Ravens, Titans was a big, big rivalry. You had the Steelers, Bengals, and Browns all in that division. So this is before they separated out into four divisions. It is. Yeah. It's, you're right. I thought crazy. of that as soon as I said, as soon as I said it, I was like, nope. Yeah, it I was, forgot that it does Indy still in the uh, AFC East. Yeah, time. with your Bills, your your Dolphins, Jets, and Patriots, your division now plus the Colts essentially is what it was. But that a that AFC Central back in the day was tough, man. That was a hard nosed football with the Ravens, Steelers, the Titans at this time with Eddie George and that defense. Bengals occasionally would show up, but ultimately that those three teams were just every time they lined up, it was a battle for sure. It's just like. 
kind of think like the AFC North now with the uh, Ravens and the Steelers, but you had four or five teams bringing it like that every week. So going into this this series, this game as well, the Titans hadn't won a postseason game, their franchise, right? They had just moved over from Houston not too long ago, and they spent some time playing at Vanderbilt before moving into their new stadium where they were for this. But they hadn't won a postseason game since 1991, which is amazing. This is the first playoff game in Nashville. This is the first playoff game for Fisher, first playoff game for Steve McNair. I mean, when you compare where we are with these two teams, Mike, it's kind of interesting because you got basically the Titans, who didn't have a long run, but they had, you know, five years there where they were very competitive, always in the mix. They were kind of starting their their runoff here, while the Bills, who have been the playoffs 10 of the previous 12 years, including, as we know, those four Super Bowls, uh, they were at the end of their dynasty. So you got kind of a, a different uh, point in each one of these franchises. Yeah, and, and you have, it's pretty interesting, because for the Bills, you have um, Hall of Famers Thurman Thomas, Bruce Smith, and Andre Reid in their last season in Buffalo. All right, so all three of these guys playing their last season in Buffalo, and this would, uh, you know, during this playoff run, and you had young guys for the Titans, right? We'll start off with their coach. I mean, at this point, Jeff Fisher's a young head coach. You have Steve McNair, young star, Eddie George, a young star, and of course, Javon Kurse, who I'm sure we'll get to here in a second. Yeah, they, they, they had a pretty nice little uh, nucleus there. And, and really going back and watching this, I was really kind of impressed. And I mean, I'm, I'm a Titans fan, I guess. I mean, I, I am, but I, you know, I'm not like you as the Jets, Mike. I don't go back to you know my, my early days in my childhood pulling for the Oilers than the Titans, right? They moved close to where I lived in Alabama. I adopted my work form for a couple of years as well on the radio side. So I had some ties there, but this was well, at this a, point. At, th- at this point, are you a Titans fan? When this game's played, yeah, I mean, when they moved to when they moved to Nashville, I, I just adopted them because uh, I mean, I like the Falcons or whatever, but I was never a Saints fan like a lot of people in Southern Alabama are. So I, I adopted the Titans a little bit when they moved there. I mean, again, it, it's the NFL in Alabama, Mike. So if I got if, I, if I missed the game on Sunday, I, I probably would not have thought twice about it. But if I caught them on TV, I'd watch them and pull for them. Right, so, so you brought you brought yourself to cheer for Al Del Greco, huh? Even though he went to Auburn. Well, that's a different story. We're going to talk about that a little bit in this game as well. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, for old Al. <laughs> uh, But yeah, so that's kind of where we are uh, with these two franchises, which is very interesting indeed. And the other side of this is the Bills. So you know, we outside of those three guys, kind of at the end of their run. Which, by the way, I, I didn't realize that was part of this game as well before I went back and watched it. Did you remember this was kind of the 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 farewell for those three? I didn't because you know what, Ben, what you're about to get into with this quarterback situation with the Bills short, sort of o- overshadowed everything for just how bizarrely it played out. Yeah, and they didn't talk about it at all in terms of like we're going to get the broadcasting crew and they were really good, but they didn't talk at all about these three and kind of what the Bills franchise was with this nucleus there. You know, obviously, Kelly's not around now and he was a big part of it too, but these these three along with Kelly, were you know the heartbeat of Buffalo for so long. And now they're kind of playing a bit of a second fiddle to everybody else, except for Bruce Smith. He had an impact in this game. But otherwise, Thurman and Andre Reid both weren't a big factor. So you're at the end of that, that, tell era, that era there, which is very interesting. We'll get into that a little bit more. But the quarterback battle, Mike. So this other part I did not remember at all about this game. And again, I didn't follow the NFL like you did at that point. So maybe it's a lot more well-known than I, than I kind of was led to believe going into this. But Doug Flutie started this entire season. We all remember Doug Flutie with the Bills. He had some good years. But he started this entire season, and then he sat out the very end in the last game. And he sat out too, right, because it was just they had already locked up their playoff bid, right? So it wasn't like he was hurt or anything. They just gave him the day off. Is that correct? Exactly. It was a meaningless game. They actually played the Colts in the last game of the regular season. So a game that didn't mean anything for either team. No, and the Colts were really good. Obviously, Colts were uh, yeah. They were the other team. thirteen and three. T- they were uh, thirteen and three team as well, um, who won their division. Yeah, so you're talking about a game that would mean been nothing, right? So we see this all the time, right? Where you you have a game that doesn't mean anything. You give your backup some playing time, and mainly just for reps and experience, nothing more, nothing less. But Rob Johnson had a pretty good game. And they made it out to believe, and maybe during this era, it was a really good game. He, he didn't even throw for 300 yards. You know, I think he's probably about a 70% completion percentage, two touchdowns, no interceptions, and they blow out the Colts, which again, in a meaningless game, okay? Cannot emphasize that enough. And somehow from that game, Wade Phillips and this Buffalo Bills coaching staff determined that Rob Johnson was their guy. So they were going to start him in the playoffs despite... Doug Flutie getting them to this point, essentially winning 10 of their games this year, 
They went with Rob Johnson. Take me back to this, Mike. Do you remember how this thing played out? Because to me, this seems really odd that this would ever happen. I mean, I can't think of another scenario outside. I mean, where, where a guy was just filling in because it was a meaningless game, didn't blow the world away, didn't, there was no injury in front of him, and he just got bumped up into that spot. Yeah, so f- I-, I followed this a little bit more than probably you did only because, you know, the Bills were a team in, in, in the Jets division. And what I remember is Bills fans being shocked by this. We have a mutual friend who is the biggest Bills fan that I know. Shout out, Farrell. Okay. <laughs> and he was like mystified by this. And w- what the question was, was like, what were they basing starting Rob Johnson on? Was it based on practice? You know, the, the you know, was it based on, it couldn't have been based on just a performance um, against the Colts was what people thought. What, what I think the consensus was, is they had given Rob Johnson a big contract um, when he came over from the Jaguars. Right. So I think that was the sort of the conclusion was that, hey, they paid this guy and they want to play him and it makes no sense to play him. I mean, even during the broadcast, they said that the fans wanted Flutie. And then McGuire said that the um, the radio shows wanted Rob Johnson. Like, what were they basing that on? Johnson, this is only Johnson's ninth start of his career in this game. And obviously, it kind of reminded me of a, who was the guy who came, who went, who went uh, Matt Flynn, Russell yeah. Wilson situation. Right. Where Rob Johnson was the guy who was paid coming into the season, but Flutie outplayed him, won the starting job, and if given a fair shot, never would have let it go. Somebody can weigh in on this a little bit more. Please, you know, feel free to reach out to us, hit us up on Twitter, you, you know, whatever. But to me, it's just so odd because, you know, with Rob Johnson, he was a fourth round pick, right? Before this season, he'd, he'd been in the NFL for four years. He had started seven games in four years, including six starts his previous year with Buffalo, right? And he threw, he threw for eight touchdowns and six starts. Eight touchdowns, three interceptions and six starts, okay? So I, I just cannot figure out how they got to this point where they wanted to sit Flutie. So as we go through this game, I'm, I'm going to have more thoughts on this. But to yeah. me, this was just such an odd, odd situation to begin with. Yeah, and, and what I keep on coming back to is usually in situations like this where you can't understand why one guy is productive and not playing, it's usually that the guy, the guy that takes his spot, the organization has more committed to him from a financial standpoint. That's the only thing I can think of because it wasn't based upon play on the field. No. <laughs> it couldn't have been based on practice. You hope not. And, and also considering the Bills starting two tackles are hurt coming into this game. Yeah. So you think you would more so want Flutie because of his experience and his better ability to scramble. Yeah, that's the other part of it. And we, they talk about this during the game. But yeah, I mean, with the offensive line banged up, you would think you want a guy to move around. And that's, that ends up being a big factor in this game was the pressure that the Titans got on Rob Johnson in the backfield. And I don't know. It's it's an I don't I don't remember this that much. And, and uh, again, because I wasn't following it as much. So if you're an NFL fan, you probably were like, hey, idiot, this was a huge story back then. But <laughs> going back and watching it now, it's just so weird because you never see anything like this happen, especially for a guy that I mean, when Rob Johnson, that, that wasn't wasn't anything special prior to this, and wasn't anything special after this season, right? It's just, it was he wasn't. It's not like he was a touted prospect. Oh, no, that's what's so but, weird. There's yeah, nothing there. Yeah, but hey, I got I got two Rob Johnson nuggets for you. Okay? okay, first of all, I used to go to Buffalo a lot for work. Right? This is probably as of four or five years ago. Bartender in the bar still calls Rob Johnson Captain Checkdown. <laughs> I love it. He's one of those guys like. People still talking about talking junk about him years after he's not even on the team anymore. Yeah. Captain Checkdown. <laughs> and also, you know what's funny is that could you get that bandana he wore? God. Could he have worn anything that made him less appealing to people from Buffalo than that bandana? There's no way. It's like the most USC California thing is that bandana. And you know the Bills fans are just sitting there watching chicken their head at that thing. He, yeah, he's so Newport Beach. That's where he's from. And you can, yeah, just, yeah, you can see it yeah. just by him on the sideline. It's it's amazing. Is there anything else? There's nothing else, Mike, pregame that we need to get into. I think that kind of gets us set for this matchup. Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. So this is, again, first playoff game of this 1999-2000 season, a wild card game, AFC playoffs. It's on ABC Sports. ABC Sports. Beautiful broadcast and a beautiful broadcast crew. Mike Patrick, Joe Theismann. Paul McGuire and Solomon Wilcox on the sideline. I know you like this one. Oh yeah. So I, you know, when I think when I think Mike Patrick and I think Joe Theismann, I think 
So for those of you who are younger or don't remember, ESPN used to have Sunday night football and ABC had Monday night football. And the Sunday night crew for years uh, was Mike Patrick and Joe Theismann. And then in the in the 90s, when I was growing up watching football, McGuire, Paul McGuire, used to always be on the Bills calls because as they went through in this broadcast, he's from Buffalo. So I thought that was good. You had two guys, Patrick and Theismann, who had worked together forever. You had McGuire, who brought the Bills influence. And it was great to hear their banter banter going back and forth during the broadcast. And they, and they had their knowledge of both the teams, nice banter going back and forth. I thought Wilcox had a pretty funny sideline report, which I think we'll get to as we're going through the game. But these guys are just – they're pros, and they were at it for a really long time. And if you watch football during this time period, you probably were fond of them. Yeah, what I liked about them as well is it wasn't just calling the game. They were talking a lot about what was happening off the field, all the stories, storylines surrounding this. And and that's something that I, I appreciate now when we go back and watch these games, Mike, because you go back and watch some of these games and you watch them in this bubble where you don't, you know, outside of if you weren't watching the entire season and didn't have the kind of a true feel of what was happening that year, a lot of times you'd miss out on some of the key storylines that were happening for that game. You wouldn't really get a true sense of where this, what this game meant everything else that led into it. But this game, you you had, a, you had a real sense. Like it took you back to that year, took you back to that moment where you could really get a f- true feel of what was happening this season and what was happening with these two teams. And it made it a lot more enjoyable to watch because this game wasn't great. But yeah, listening to these an, guys was great. Yeah, there's an art to it though, right? I mean, as we go back and watch these games, the fact that they were weaving in these big storylines within the broadcast, there's an art to that because there's sometimes we do these games and you wouldn't even know. Like, remember we did the the Patriots Giants Super Bowl? Yeah. And they didn't even mention the Patriots were undefeated the whole game. I know. Um, <laughs> you, you know, so you begin to appreciate little things like this. I agree with you on that. Yeah, it was huge. So, all right, let's go key players first, Mike, on each one of these, uh, these rosters that we look at. Because this took me back to some guys, obviously, with the Titans for me. But, yeah, Steve McNair, as we mentioned, Eddie George. But the defense, I think, for the Titans is what was really special with this team. So you had Javon Kurse, rookie season, obviously already made a huge impact. But you have some guys behind him. Samari Roll was a, was a really good defensive back for at least a brief amount of time. Blaine Bishop was solid. Um, you had a good, you just had a good nucleus of guys on this team. They weren't, wasn't super flashy, but there's a really solid defense uh, with the Titans. Yeah, Jeff Fisher, I mean, you know, for all the razzing he gets for always being around 500 with the teams he coaches, he always has competitive defenses, uh, and this defense was no different. Curse, 14 and a half sacks and 10 forced fumbles his rookie year. Uh, That has to be the best uh, rookie year from a pass rusher since I've been watching football. I didn't realize his stats were that good that year. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, you have the offense led by McNair and Eddie George, but this uh, this is peak Eddie George. We're not at like a, a really, really good Steve McNair at this point yet. He would get better um, as this playoff run even went on and definitely as the years went on. But you have Eddie George, very much the focal point of everything going on with the Titans. Yeah, Javon Kurse came out of the gates. Just It was his best season by far as a pro, too. I mean, he had three really good years to start off his career with Tennessee. Then he battled injuries. And then we ended up in Philadelphia and did okay, but did not have nearly the impact that he had with this team this season. And he, and he did make a big impact in this game as well. So, I mean, it was it was a complete season for Curse, but you don't you rarely see a guy have such an impact his rookie year, and then it all just kind of go downhill from that point forward. But that's kind of what it was for for Curse. On the other side, for the Bills, we we talked about some of the key players, but ahead of guys like Thurman Thomas and, and Andre Reid, who had who had been the mainstays for so long. This Buffalo team featured Antoine Smith running the ball, who was a very solid running back. And then Eric Moulds was their key wide receiver alongside Peerless Price and kind of overshadowed what Andre Reid had been doing for so long. Yeah, and that, that's a good – That's a, those are good weapons there for the Bills. I had forgotten those offensive weapons were so quality, giving, you know, Flutie and Johnson, you know, good weapons to work with. Mould, Reid, Price, like you said, Antoine Smith, even the backup running back, Linton, mm-hmm. Jonathan Linton looked good in this game. So, you know, the Bills uh, had some great weapons. And I don't know if you realized this before you watched this game. I didn't realize their defense this year was so stout. And they were number one in, in the NFL in a lot of categories. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it either. I put up a picture on our Instagram account if you want to check it out, just a replay podcast, with the ranks because they, they flashed them up there. And I, too, was surprised by it. First in total yards, first in pass yards allowed, fourth in rush yards allowed, and second in points allowed. This is the first time since 1980 they had led the NFL 
and total yards in defense. So again, I don't remember this defense being that good, but you could tell when you watched them, there wasn't a ton of like guys that stood out to you as huge like Hall of Famers or anything. It was just an all around solid unit. Yeah, and you got another good defensive coach, obviously, in Wade Phillips. So another guy who always has good defenses. The only two guys on this defense I recognize their names were Bruce Smith and Sam Cowart. Other guys came back to me as we watched the game, but those two guys stood out when they were doing the opening lineups. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, there's not a lot of guys, even to this day, that I still can uh, point out, pick out of a lineup probably. So for them to be as good as they were at that point, says something for that coaching staff and what they were able to do with their roster. So let's jump into this game and uh, let's kick it off. You know, one of the first things that I saw in this, Mike, that caught my attention early on was Steve McNair stats when they flashed him up in the first quarter. 12 touchdowns and eight interceptions for the season. And I know he, he was injured some, but you know, you think back to Steve McNair, you think about a guy that was throwing the ball over the field, running, uh, you know, scrambling with his legs and getting out of the pocket and, and breaking defenses down that way. But I was kind of I was kind of surprised to see what his actual stats were. Yeah, his stats. I mean, he only started 11 regular season games because he had back surgery earlier in the season. Um, but yeah, this is just a different Titans overall offensive um, strategy than I can remember in their heyday. Much, I mean, they were always pretty much centered around Eddie George, but but in this game, a lot. I mean, they were super conservative, especially here in the first quarter. Yeah, both teams were pretty conservative, but especially the Titans. Right off the bat, we see Curse making an impact. Sack fumble on the Bills' second possession. The Titans took it over um, at the 30, but settled for a field goal that uh, Del Greco misses left. And, I, and Mike, when I go back and think about Del Greco. I don't know what you even remember about him because most of the time you only remember kickers that were on your team specifically. You don't really think about other kickers unless they're all-time greats like Vinatieri. But otherwise, you just, you know, a guy, a guy comes in, he kind of passes through your memory and he, he exits. But for Del Greco, he was a solid kicker, but it seemed like he always had these games and, and really big, big games. That he had one against the Ravens, I think before this at some point, maybe right around this time, where he would just go and, and have one of the worst games ever where everything he kicked was offline. He had a kind of a start to this game. He'd kind of pull it back together, but all around, not not a very solid performance by him in this game. Yeah, Del Greco and, and a lot of other kickers who aren't top flight kickers. Like they're not like the Justin Tuckers of the world. These these kickers, they're a lot like relief pitchers in baseball. You think like, like hey, going into the game, like, hey, this guy's not that bad, but you really never know until they let that first kick go and you see how the game's gonna go. You know, yeah. and I think Del Greco fell into that category. I like that comparison to relief pitchers. That's pretty good. That's dead yeah, accurate, too. Yeah. What else we got? The Titans had three sacks in the Bills' first three possessions. Again, going back to that, you know, the, the defensive front, Curse and those guys, but also on the other side, Rob Johnson just wasn't able to do a whole lot when they got pressure on him. Not all his, not his fault completely in a lot of those, but again, he's not a guy that's going to get out of the pocket. Not a lot in this quarter, though. 17 total yards for the Titans, 0 0 after the first. Is there anything else that you caught on to this first quarter, Mike, that, that's worth talking about? Yeah, something that has nothing to do with the game action. They mentioned a lineman for the Titans, a defensive lineman who I did not get his name, was playing in this game with 100 and stitch, 150 stitches in his face. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned this. So I had this in my what notes that? for Titans roster notes. So Marcus Robertson, he was uh, one of the safeties on that team. And I went back and rewound it a couple of times because I was like, 150 stitches. Okay, maybe if it's on his leg or some, but it was on his face, they said. I don't even know how. <laughs> know. Oh, and he was he was a defensive back. I did this yeah. as a defensive lineman. That's a lot of stitches. Dude, I don't even know how 150 stitches has to cover your like entire face, right? I mean. He probably looked like a baseball. <laughs> and they showed yeah. a picture of him. You didn't, you didn't notice it, but. That's something you think you would talk about a little bit more. So that's the one mark we have against this broadcasting crew. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to hear the more on that story with him playing 150 stitches. And now we're on that, too. Let me also hit you with this one. Sam Gash was the fullback for the Bills. I think they talk about this first quarter. I, want, I meant to mention it, but first Pro Bowl running back without a carry on the season for the first time ever in the NFL that happened. Yeah, and this may be low-key. The best battle of fullbacks Absolutely. in NFL playoff history. Absolutely. You had Lorenzo Neal and Sam Gash. I think they said <laughs> there was two total carries between these guys it, the whole season, and Neal had both of them. <laughs> yes, but these are if you're a fullback guy, right? This is like your this is like Nirvana for you because oh, absolutely, it, these are the two of the best fullbacks I could remember. Second quarter, Bills' first possession from inside their own ten. Uh, ABC comes back talking about the, the quarterback decision. They're doing a really good job. This is the storyline. They're really kind of jumping on here in the second quarter to talk about it. First play, Rob Johnson stumbles, dropping back, 
Curses right on him, strips it, knocks out of the end zone as he's taking him down for a sack. Ball goes through the end zone. It's a safety, 2 nothing. Perfect timing on that uh, discussion by that broadcast crew. Yeah, so if you keep in score at home, Javon Curse, two sacks, two forced fumbles, and a safety early in the second quarter here. Yep, and they got a 2 nothing game early on. I love Mike Patrick coming back from one of the breaks. It's 2 nothing, top of the second here for Tennessee. But we move on, big <laughs> return after this, this safety. Sets up another good drive for the Titans. They don't have a lot lot of room to have to go. McNair finishes it off with a little bootleg touchdown. Titans are all of a sudden up 9 nothing. And again, this is where the Titans haven't done anything really too spectacular at this point. They had really maybe one good drive with this touchdown drive as a you know, short field. Their defense has played really, really well. And I think that was a big part of it, Mike. They kept pressure on the Bills in this first half, and they were winning the field position battle every single series. Yeah, and another big storyline here was the Bills shooting themselves in the foot. On that McNair touchdown drive, the Bills forced a fumble, recovered the fumble, but it was negated because Bruce Smith was offsides. And as a whole, up to this point in the game, the Bills have seven penalties and Tennessee has zero. So this would become a common theme here in this first half. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And the Titans, Titans again, have one more possession to try to add to this 9 nothing lead. It looks like this half's about to end. Steve McNair scrambles. He's going out of bounds. They rule him about a yard and a half short of the marker. He was kind of he was kind of one of those where you're diving out. You can't see where the ball is. The ball's stretched out as the foot kind of goes out of bounds. So you're trying to get an idea of exactly where the ball is. They go to review. Give him the first down. I thought it was a pretty good call. I mean, was, this is an era where you're not getting a ton of instant replay. I mean, this is still kind of a newer thing. Uh, but that was a big play early on because it kept that drive alive and let them get down the field. Yeah, and and one uni- – first of all, I thought he definitely got the first down after you saw it over and over again. But did you notice the graphic, the total delay time graphic up yeah. in the top right of the screen? Yeah. That's that pretty great. interesting, right? I yeah. t- totally forgot about that. They don't have that nowadays. No, they only had that for a couple of years maybe. I, I, that could have been somewhere the NFL's like, hey, you guys are making this look bad. Can you take that yeah, out of the Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who may not be following what I'm talking about, it's basically from the time the replay was initiated till the time the referee made a decision, they literally kept that time. Like yeah. So it was like three minutes and 50 yeah, seconds. Almost four minutes, something like that yep. for this yep. review. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, so the Titans did end up driving down the field, set up a field goal. Your boy Del Greco misses it, but there's a flag. They give him another opportunity. He does bang this one home. So 12 nothing, as you mentioned, Titans played okay, but the Bills shooting themselves in the foot a number of times. But again, I mean, even, even besides that, their offense hadn't done a whole lot in this game. Their defense kept a minute so far. I mean, I think 12 nothing is as good as you could ask for for the Bills at this point. But maybe for the Titans, you might have hoped as, as much as you kind of controlled that half and had a lot of opportunities, maybe you, you want to be up a little bit more than 12 nothing at this point. Yeah, I mean, when your opponent has nine penalties, you sack them five times, and I think the Bills had like 70 total yards or something like that. There was under 200 yards total between both teams. I think you're right. If you're the Titans, maybe you wish you, you took a little bit more advantage, but nonetheless, they are up 12 nothing heading into the half. Yeah, total yards, 120 for the Titans, 64. 64 for the Bills in the first half. The Bills didn't even have a sec, uh, a first down in the second quarter alone. And as you mentioned, nine penalties for the Bills, zero penalties for the Titans in the first half. So, I mean, that, that's about as lopsided as you get. I mean, outside of the yardage, and the Titans only had 120 yards, so not a huge deal there. But otherwise, that's about as lopsided as you get. They have a good, uh, good report from Solomon Wilcox on the sideline to start the half. He talks about the Bills O-line being injured, number one. But then asked Wade Phillips at half, is there a chance we see Doug Flutie in the second half? And he said, I can't tell you what Wade Phillips said to me after that. Let's just say he was very angry. Yeah, Solomon Wilcott said, quote unquote, it wasn't too kind (laughs) what Phillips had said to him. And I thought it was funny because I could be wrong. I don't remember any other Solomon Wilcott sideline reports the whole game. (laughs) But he came in with this zinger that was really funny and, and added a little bit to the broadcast. I thought that was good. Yeah, he was really good. I think he had a few, but yeah, not. They he's good. Solomon Wilcox is good. He he was doing play by. I don't know if he's still doing play by play for CBS, but he's solid. Unfortunately, he's always on these lower rung AFC games, so I see him plenty with the Jets. <laughs> Twelve nothing at half. We go to the third quarter. Starts off. Bills have the ball and they come out quick. Antoine Smith broke a forty-four yard run to start the half. Kind of came up a little gimpy. You thought maybe this could be a problem for them, but they finish off that drive. 
with a touchdown pretty quickly. All of a sudden, it's 12-7. The Bills essentially match their entire first half yardage in that one drive, and they're right back in this game. Yeah, yeah, like you mentioned, 64 yards the whole first half, 62 on that drive for the Bills. And Antoine Smith, you know, this is sort of the start of him being like a low-key, good playoff running, productive running back. I mean, he did he was he had a good game here with the Bills, and he would obviously go on to play a key role with the Patriots as well. Yeah, he was solid, had a good career. Bills second drive, they talk about Andres Reed in this this drive too. So this I thought was a very interesting conversation. And we talk about the storylines, but you know, outside of Andre Reed kind of wrapping up his career at Buffalo, there's a lot of tension with Andre Reed in this game and in this team and and how he felt about him. And they had some very interesting quotes that they talked about. And I was again surprised they kind of stayed it to this point in the game. But I thought this quote was very interesting. And, and Joe Pendry was uh one of the assistant coaches. He actually went on to coach at Alabama, Mike. I don't know if you knew that. It's an offensive oh, line no, coach. I'm not but. familiar with Joe Pendry's <laughs> coaching pedigree. His career path. Um, yeah, his career path. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this quote, though, that they actually put up on the screen as a graphic. You may have heard, this is Andre Reid, by the way, on Flutie and Pendry. You may have heard that I'm not on speaking terms with Doug Flutie. Doug Flutie has changed as a person over one year, and Joe Pendry has had a plan for me from day one. You don't do that to people because it comes back to bite you. Dude, I didn't realize how much was going on in Buffalo. And what about what about Andre? It was That was posted on Andre Reid's website. What about Andre <laughs> being ahead of the curve? posting stuff on his website. Hey, hot take here. Did Derek Jeter steal the Players' Tribune <laughs> idea from Andre Reid? He was he was well ahead of his time, you're right. Trailblazer. He controlled the narrative from the jump. He and did control the narrative. That's funny. And it's amazing, too. I mean, it, I, I just didn't realize there was that that much uh, drama behind the scenes with Andre Reid. I mean, I guess he felt disrespected as he, you yeah, know. Apparently. He was not was not one of their top options. But, man, they had Eric Moulds and Peerless Price. You know, you're winding down your career. I don't know what else you expected. Uh, but what do you think the website name was? I don't know. Andre83.com? I don't know, man. I don't know. This is a good question. <laughs> but I, I, I was surprised that they said that too because, yeah, it, this is an era where there's not a ton of website content going on really anywhere. This is this is AOL for sure. But beyond that, there's not a lot going on, but he was, he was ahead of the game. Got to give him credit on that. So, yeah, so that was a big, again, a big discussion in the third quarter, which I thought was very interesting. But Titans get the ball back a little bit later, kind of go back and forth a little bit. I mean, Aaron throws his first interception, a tip pass. Bills take over at their own 46, five and a half minutes left in this uh, third quarter. Again, Bills really can't do a whole lot with it. At this point, Mike, I'm asking myself, too, because, you know, they had the one good drive, really kind of keyed on an Antoine Smith run. Why, why, why is this not a, a spot where the Bills are just running the football every time? Kind of like the Titans were. Like this is not going. There's no, this is not going to turn into a shootout. There's no chance this game turns into a shootout. Why don't you try to control time of possession, hand Antoine Smith the ball, and just try to run some clock because you're not doing anything through the air. Yeah, when you have two backup tackles like the Bills had in this game, and you actually have something that's working, like running the ball was working for them. You should stick with it. I, I completely agree with that. That's it's not the time to sort of open things up and, and have a well balanced offense, especially when the Titans are obviously putting a lot of pressure on uh, Rob Johnson in passing situations. And again, at this point too, and I go back to Wilcott's question to Phillips at halftime. But why? I mean, Mike, again, there there had to be something else going on behind the scenes because I just don't know at this point how you don't give Flutie a chance. I mean, I, I know that this only it's only a five point game, but it's still at this point. As a Buffalo fan, I gotta feel like you you know, you feel like this five points feels like it's probably two scores, maybe even three scores with the way you played. Like I just don't get how Flutie doesn't even get at least one series to see what he can do. Yeah, and and, and you know what we don't know is is if is Wade Phillips really the one even making the decision who's playing quarterback, you know? It's something that again we again if you're a Bills fan, please chime in and let us know. But it could have been something that was coming from ownership or the front office. You never know. But yeah. I agree. There's had we have to be missing something here. 12-7 after three quarters. We go to the fourth. Bills start the quarter with a big third down play. Johnson converts it scrambling, so he does actually have a little bit of legs. Next play, throws a deep pass to Eric Mould. It's again, credit to the broadcast crew because right before they went to that the, the end of quarter, which was only three football plays prior to this, seemed like a lifetime because they switched fields and commercials and all that. But they were talking about this is a good spot probably to go downfield to Eric Mould's big target. And a couple of plays later, they actually do that. He makes a big catch. The the Titans still stand up. They get a third down and seven for the Bills in a five-point game. They're about the 15, 20-yard line. Incomplete pass, but Javon Kurse, too aggressive, gets hit with a roughing the passer. 
automatic first down. Three plays later, touchdown for the Bills. Now it's 13-12 to after a failed two-point conversion. Yeah, and this is the beginning of that era where, you know, if you go helmet to helmet on the quarterback, it's going to be, you know, roughing the passer. And you could tell, like, the announcers still at this point, they understand why it's a penalty, but they probably don't agree with it kind of thing because we're coming out of that really physical era of football and we're getting into the helmet to helmet contact era. We're getting into the, you know, you can't chuck people at the line of scrimmage if you're a defensive back. That era is coming soon. You know, so the game getting gearing more towards offense starting, uh, you know, not just with the 99 season, but it, it would really continue as we got into the 2000s. So the Titans offense now, they're they're trailing and it's on the it's on the offense to actually do something, but they're still struggling. Bad, I really can't do a whole lot. At one point they show a graphic, ABC does, with McNair's passing chart. He'd only thrown two passes beyond 15 yards from the line of scrimmage, which is just, I mean... I know that, that Fisher was kind of conservative and his, the, the tools that he had, it's just kind of it's a game plan they usually took into a game. But you look at like this team compared to you know the eventual Super Bowl winners this year, the, the, the greatest show on turf you know, the, with St. Louis, and compare the two. I mean, it's, it's rough to watch. The fact that they didn't even take any shots downfield is still surprising. I know you got a good running back, but, I mean, come on. Yeah, to me, that just shows that Jeff Fisher probably had confidence that Rob Johnson and that offense could not move the ball consistently on his defense, and he just didn't want the offense to lose it for him. I mean, I don't really agree with being conservative in any situation, never mind the playoffs, but he was going to go with it until it didn't work. Well, speaking of conservative, under eight minutes left, Titans are now at fourth and three. They had a fourth and two, maybe. Great run stop by the Bills right around midfield. Sets up a fourth and three. We're under eight minutes again. Your offense hasn't done much at all. I thought for sure you'd consider at least talk about going for it there. But even the announcers didn't really spend a whole lot of time on it. The the Titans were punting. And I guess, I mean, I understand the defense is there, but your defense still, you feel like they can hold them at midfield just as well. You haven't had a whole lot of shots here. This might be one of your, your better opportunities this late in the game. I mean, did you think at all they should have gone for that? It, it, it crossed my mind. But again, getting back to Fisher's overall game plan, I mean, hey, if you could pin them and rely on your defense even more, that's probably what he was thinking there. But I hear what you're saying. It did work. I mean, they, they did hold the Bills and get the ball back, back, and the return came across midfield. So it all played out in Fisher's favor, so I can't really question it there. But the Titans here, so this is a very interesting stretch, too. 6-15 left, one-point game. Titans are still not doing a whole lot, but there is one huge play. Again, I put this up on our Instagram account, and I'll also put it up on our website as well, distantreplaypodcast.com. A catch by Wycheck, who was really the focal point of this, this receiving core, and he's a tight end, which tells you all you need to know. But he was very good. He made an incredible catch off that came off a defender's arm, and he had to first react to it, and then a couple of juggles to bring the ball in as he's going to the turf. And I couldn't believe it when I saw it in the moment. I did kind of remember it after the fact, like, okay, I do remember that catch a little bit. But that was a huge play because it got him into third manageable without that because it's not a good pass. It hit the defender first. It's third and long, and there's probably a good chance they don't get a first down there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what about the defender, not the linebacker, not even looking at the ball to the point where it literally hit him in the forearm and he didn't even <laughs> react. But like you said, great play by Wycheck uh, to sort of keep his concentration there. And, you know, he was the best pass catching option for the Titans, not only in this game, but it seemed like for the whole season. I mean, they went into how he had over 60 catches. And he was going to go to the Pro Bowl. Uh, and we're, we're talking Wycheck is like an old school, quote unquote, receiving tight end. Yeah. I mean, these days you're used to seeing the Kelseys and the Gronkowskis and the Zach Ertz. You know, he's a very much a lumbering tight end, uh, but very effective for this day and age. Yeah, Wycheck's like a Nashville legend too. Like he came around, the, came on the scene as they were moving to Nashville and really had a huge impact and, and made a ton of big plays. And he was in radio for a long time. I'm not sure if he's still on the radio broadcast there, but big, big guy in Nashville and, and rightfully so. He had a great career for, for the Titans. But next play, third down, the Titans uh, are able to convert it. Steve McNair scramble. And they have a great drive the rest of the way out. They continue to kind of methodically run the clock, get it down the field. They only went like 30 yards. I don't even know if they went 30. They went on 20 yards in like five minutes. So they were able to really milk the clock on this drive. Set up a field goal with 153 left. They got it down to the 18, set the field goal. And I was thinking, man, McNair, he, he might, uh, Girl Greco might actually miss this. <laughs> he even, even looked back on it, but he did hit it. Made it a 15-13 to 13 game with a minute 48 left there. At what point, what are you thinking there, Mike? Like, I mean, I know you know what happens, but you kind of get a sense of these games, kind of which, which the momentum and how it's, how it's shifting there. I, I felt it. I was, I was kind of surprised here that the, the Bills could get all the way down the field in a minute, you know, a minute and change. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you're sitting here watching it, you're like, hey, look, we need a good drive by Rob Johnson. And he hadn't really put together a really good drive that was based on passing the ball, you know, this whole game so far. So that's the first thing that comes through, comes to your mind. Bill's got a good return, though. And then, then uh, one pass by Rob Johnson, a good throw. And it seemed like he was a little bit looser here, too, on this drive. Like, they just let him go. Like, hey, you know, do what you got to do. He, he slung it around a little bit. A uh, good pass got him across midfield. And then he had a huge moment in this, this drive where after a uh, completion or after a play, clock's still running. They think they're going to call a timeout or, or, or just stop the clock because he lost his shoe, Rob Johnson did. But he ran another play and rolled out and made a good throw for a, uh, what, right about a first down, down to the 24-yard line. is a huge play in that moment. And even the broadcast crew, which I thought was interesting because you don't hear the word miracle thrown around a whole lot in games, especially for a play like that. It was a, it's a good play, but it didn't really do anything but get him six yards. They said this is a bit of a miracle play for the Bills. I was like, hey, that's interesting what's coming here in about a minute and a half. Yeah, you ain't kidding. And also, I'll get to something Paul McGuire said here. After the Bills kicked a field goal here with 20 seconds left, right? McGuire, quote unquote, says, does Wade Phillips look like a genius after the made field goal in reference to him playing Rob Johnson? Yeah. Well, look, the funny part about that was, the funny part about that was, the Bills kicked that field goal with 20 seconds left on first down. So, yeah. So they get a first down. They have no timeouts left, right? So they get the first down. The, the clock stopped, I think, at this point, right, Mike? So... They went ahead and set up for the field goal. Titans called timeout, try to ice them. But I was thinking the same thing. There's 20 seconds left. I know you have zero timeouts, but 20 seconds is just take a knee in the center of the field and then have your crew coming out there ready to spike the ball. You know what I mean? Like That's an awful decision. It's, so, that, it's, it's such a simple play. Obviously, that's never talked about because what would happen next, but it should be talked about even more because of what happened next. I mean, the, the, what an awful awful decision by Wade <laughs> Phillips. I mean, I guess it shouldn't be that surprising. Wade Phillips is a great defensive coach, never been that much of an offensive coach, and certainly has never been a good, you know, clock management, knowing when to take timeouts. You know, the more and more you watch the NFL, you begin to know who are the guys who really know the game and who are the guys who are just meant to be coordinators. And that really showed in this in this instance because to take it again, first down with 20 seconds left to kick the field goal there. I mean, he made it, right? But the fact that McGuire says immediately after that, well, does Wade Phillips look like a genius, made me chuckle. Now, listen, in all fairness to the Bills and Wade Phillips, it did take a miracle play in order to lose this ball game. But to your argument, and I agree with you, you should not have left him any time on the clock to begin with. It should yeah, have been a could, kick could, as the, the clock expired. That kick, exactly. That kick should have been the last play of the game. Go home. Thanks for coming out. Yep, exactly. But it left him 16 seconds on the clock. And again, history's made at that point. So this is very interesting, too. I mean, this this play, I'm sure, has been dis dissected many, many, many times. So we're not going to add anything completely new here. But I got a couple thoughts on it. You know, one, the play, it was a, it was a lateral. And I, I was surprised, though, throughout the, all the, the replays they showed. I don't know if you noted, there was one really, really good replay. It looked like it was probably from like the 30, like a, like a camera at the 30-yard line, fairly high up that had a good shot from high down on the play, but right along the line, essentially. it was. They only showed this replay, I think, one time. And it was the one time that Mike Patrick said, because Mike Patrick this whole time saying, that's, that, is a, a, that is a forward pass. Wade Phillips knows that he's not even upset on the sideline because he knows that play's coming back. Phillips, I mean, uh, Patrick's even laughing at his, his analysts. Like, his analysts were like, oh, this, this is pretty close. This will be a really close call. And he's, he, I think he even said at one point, that's not that close. And then this one replay flashed in. But this one replay I had not seen. Like it, It's like the lost, like the Zapruder films, whatever it is. Right? Zapruder. Zapruder films. That's what it's like. Like you can't find this film anywhere. It's like this, this one shot. They kept showing a replay from like field level that showed a pretty good shot. But this one was directly down the line. So you saw the ball drift back just a little bit. Yeah, and this is one of those plays. And the announcers, I think... Uh, had the same reaction as everyone watching the game. When you first saw that play, it was such an awkward play. They were like, oh, that's a forward lateral. You know what I mean? Because what you didn't have the advantage of in the moment is why checks arm angle. So it's based on where the ball is, not where the player's bodies are. So why check when he goes to throw the ball across the field uh, to Dyson, throws it sidearm. And by way of throwing it sidearm, it came back to where Dyson was standing. So you couldn't catch that, though, in the moment. And I thought it was good. Again, the announcers sort of 
change their viewpoint as they saw replays. They mm-hmm. didn't get stuck at their call, you know, stuck on, oh, it was definitely a, a forward lateral, you know. He, they changed their opinion just like everyone watching the game. And I'll never, again, I watched this with our Bills fan friend, and I'll never forget his reaction. And I'll never forget my reaction. I, I was imagine. stunned because I was just like Mike Patrick. I was like, oh, that was a forward lateral. Right. You know, uh, I didn't think it was possible. Well, that was it. I left three seconds left on the clock, and the, and the, the Titans squibbed one, and uh, the game ended right there. So Titans were able to pull it out. Uh, a shocker known as the Music City Miracle. You know about it. 22 16. Titans would advance in the playoff. Bills, another crushing, crushing loss in the playoffs for a team over the last decade plus. That's all they had experienced. They'd probably go back now and take any kind of playoff loss at this point. But this was a very, very brutal game and one for the history books. But what a heck of a way to open up things in Nashville, Mike, for the playoffs and the Titans. Like, this is how you become a Titans fan. I'm surprised you didn't jump on the bandwagon at this point. (laughs) <laughs> the Titans for me were always known as a team where like you would know two or three guys, but then like most of the team, you'd be like, who's that? <laughs> like, you know, you mentioned Blaine Bishop before, right? Right. Like, he's like a typical Titan, like good player, but you're like, oh yeah, Blaine Bishop. I remember him, <laughs> you know? Hey, hey, but Ben, quick, quick, quick question. If you're a Bills fan, would you rather, what is a worse loss to you? Getting blown out in a Super Bowl or this game? I think we talked about something like this before. I mean, I guess I would take... I guess I would take it blown out in the Super Bowl would be what I would prefer just because you're in the Super Bowl. They had Bowl. this game won. That, that's a, there's a big difference. I hear. I, I agree with but you. They're not, but, Mike, they're not going anywhere with Rob Johnson at quarterback in this playoff. Who knows? They'll, maybe Dude, they'll, stop they flip, it. Maybe they'd start Flutie the next game. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Well, let's go to post game. Let's transition. Got a few thoughts here. Let's start off with, uh, start off with some what-ifs, Mike, because there's some obviously some good what-if scenarios. My first one is what if Flutie starts? I mean, I just, I can't imagine again, we're beating a dead horse maybe for anybody that's listening, but I just still, I feel like he couldn't have done anything worse than what Rob Johnson provided this team offensively. That's a fair point. And certainly Flutie's upside by way of winning 10, you know, 10 games in the season, Flutie's upside, I think was better. He's a veteran. Him being able to figure out the, the rush, you know what I mean? Him being able to figure out the you know, uh, the pressure of the Titans and sort of rolling the other way and creating plays off of that. I think you had a much better chance with Flutie. I agree with that. Yeah. And the other what if I have too is that final kick. I mean, they, they talked about it prior to the kickoff. Should we kick it deep? Should you squib it? I think, uh, I don't know who it was. Maybe it was McGuire said you should kick it deep here, make them return to make them eat clock kind of in between, you know, it's, it's kind of pooched up to that, that second level, but my what ifs, if you would have done either, if you would have kicked it as deep as possible or if you would have squibbed it, does this thing end up the same way? I mean, any other kick besides what happened there, does this game end up differently? And it, this this whole play, going back and watch it, it's just so amazing that it works out that way. Like, what if they kick it to wide check first? Or what if it's a little bit further to the right, you know, and doesn't end up in, in, in Neil's hands where he is able to just to kind of quickly pitch it to, to wide check? Anything else, Mike, literally, in this game probably ends differently. If you just would have kicked it away from Wycheck, I think the game would have ended differently because they made a good point of mentioning that Wycheck threw a touchdown pass earlier in the season. So you happen to to kick it in the vicinity of a guy who could actually throw. You know, that's not an easy throw he did. He threw it all the way across the field, falling backwards, flinging it sidearm. So, uh, you know, that, that's another good point, though. Yeah, it's a tight spiral, too. What it what was. ifs do you have? Anything? I, my biggest what if is, is the end of the game there. Uh, if the Bills don't kick the field goal with 20 seconds left on first down and run at least one more play. Um, and I think that takes away the complete ability for this miracle to happen. Outdated items from this game. A couple things here. So we mentioned as Y2K. We did get one good millennium joke from Mike Patrick. Oh, this is the first time you've been right this millennium, Joe. So we had one of those great And they dad started jokes. busting out <laughs> laughing when he said that too. Like the, like the most original thing they'd ever heard. Yeah, that was great. Uh, <laughs> along with that, uh, Puma was the official jersey of the NFL. How, how long? I do actually, by the way, Mike, I do own a Puma Eddie George Titans jersey. Nice. But how many, how many years was Puma on board? Was it more than one year? I, I, I don't <laughs> think it could have been because I don't remember much Puma memorabilia. You might have a limited edition, edition uh, jersey there. <laughs> I could. Along the same line of the Y2K, the graphics patch, package that uh, the ES, the ABC used, did it have, was it like a spaceship theme, like a new, like new frontier? Like it had kind of this Y2K feel to it. Did, did you pick up on that? Yeah, it was, it's kind of hard to explain Y2K unless you live through it or, or can remember it. But 
Um, everyone thought there was going to be this big change, like, oh, the new millennium, and not, not, nothing really much changed except for people trying to sort of force a change. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, the, the graphics package was, was a little over the top. Yeah, I don't know if it was like that the whole year or what, but it was, it was very interesting. The other outdated is fullbacks, and we've already kind of touched on it, but rarely do you see a, a, a matchup like this with two hard-nosed fullbacks that are literally there just to block. Both that both had neck rolls. <laughs> both were right out of central casting, and they were really good players too. All kidding aside, they were really. Uh, any outdated for you? Yeah, the crowd was chanting "Whoop!" There it is, yes, right after yes, the uh, right weird. after the touchdown. <laughs> that so was awesome. Th- that that was pretty outdated and pretty awesome. I'm not gonna lie. That's hilarious. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned before that clock on the uh, challenge that showed the total time elapsed. I thought that was um, that was uh, outdated. Also, big pads. This is one of the last <laughs> eras here where players wear gigantic <laughs> pads. You know, there was a meeting somewhere where someone said, "Hey, look, if we put smaller pads on these guys, they could probably move faster." <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know what they were, thought they were doing with those big pads, other than giving people the false sense of security that they could just throw their bodies around and not get hurt. But that's amazing. All right, so this from this game, the Titans would actually go on to the Super Bowl. They had a great run through the playoffs as the wild card. They would beat Indianapolis in the next round by three, then go on to beat Jacksonville, who had the best record in uh, football. They would beat them 33-14 in Jacksonville and then go on to face St. Louis, who, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, greatest show on turf. And one of the great Super Bowl games that we might have to go back and watch here on this podcast, Mike, but... The Kevin Dyson one yard short in the end zone. The Titans were really, this was their best shot at a Super Bowl, close to save gotten, and they fell just a yard short. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I mentioned before about the changing of the eras in the NFL. I remember when it was Titans, Rams in the Super Bowl, and you're like, ew. Right. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, you're like, man, no Bills, no Cowboys, you know, no uh, Broncos, no 49ers. We got the the Titans the, and the Rams, the, you know? The, the championship games that year were Tampa Bay, St. Louis, and Tennessee, Jacksonville. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a gross. Yeah, if it, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the Rams were obviously a historic team with their offense. T- Tampa would become a very good team in the coming years, but to think that Tampa, the Rams, all four of those teams, to think that they were in the conference championship games was stunning back then. Tampa Bay, by the way, lost that game in the NFC Championship 11-6. I don't know if you remember yeah, that. The, that the Ricky Prohl touchdown. He <laughs> scored the only touchdown. They had all the Rams had all these good players on offense. And when it came down to it, the only touchdown was by Ricky Prohl. That's amazing. The Bills, of course, exited the playoffs, stage left. This was 10 years out of 12. They had been in the playoffs. Now they lost three straight wild card playoff games. Um, so they had not advanced too far since those four Super Bowl appearances. But this would be it for the Bills. All the way until 2017. Then they would lose the wild card to the Jaguars. And then again last year in 19, they lost the wild card to the Texans. So pretty uh, pretty amazing stuff for the Bills. But man, what an end of an error for Reed, uh, Smith, and then Thurman. And we didn't even mention Thurman only had a handful of carries in this game. His last carry would be him trying to plant slipping and spraining his knee and being out for the rest of the game. And that was the end of his Bills career. Yeah, and you look at when this Bills team burst onto the scene, right? It, for a lot of people, it was in that Super Bowl that we did. I think it was the third episode we did against the Giants. That game marked by that heartbreaking missed field goal. And then the, for what many people consider to be the very last game of this era against the Titans here, marked by the Music City Miracle. So Pretty amazing. You, you mentioned legacies, Mike. So let's get into that here to finish out the show. How do you think things could have looked differently had this game gone and the Bills would have closed it out? I don't know. I have to question like what happens with the – I mean, this is the, would be the only Super Bowl run the Titans went on, right? So, yeah. I mean, Jeff Fisher ended up being the, the Titans coach for 14 years, didn't he? I think it was 14 or yeah. 15 years. Yeah, I mean, forever. I mean, he, he, you got to think he doesn't last that long as coach. Steve McNair, only Super Bowl he ever made is he thought of as being such a legendary uh, quarterback, you know, within the, the franchise of the Titans – um, if he doesn't make a Super Bowl, you know, I, I, those are definitely the, you know, the sort of legacy stuff I see with the Titans and with the Bills. I mean, just a who knows where this playoff run goes. Do they go back to Flutie? Is, you know, Wade Phillips sort of characterized a little bit differently as a head coach if they win this game? 
those are some of the things that come to mind for me. Yeah, Fisher would go on to coach until the end of the 2010 season, and he won a couple more playoff games from that, but never until this past season, 2019, did the Titans ever win more than one playoff game in a single season. Uh, it was just that very first year in Nashville. Really? That's surprising to me. Yeah, it was that very like first year Like you said, they were in the mix. They were in the mix for at least half a decade here straight. Yeah, they won their division a couple of years, two out of three years after this this year. They lost to the Ravens in a divisional game. They would win one game against the Steelers, didn't lose in the AFC Championship to the Raiders. But they only had won one game there. Um, so, I mean, listen, it was it was a, a tough tough run for them. They've been in the mix, as you mentioned, but then that's why Jeff Fisher eventually had to go because he had a lot of decent teams but could never really do a whole lot except, except maybe just compete and, and be in the mix but could never go beyond that. And they had some good teams. I mean, McNair won the MVP in 2003. Vince Young was Offensive Rookie of the Year. Chris Johnson was Offensive a Player of the Year in 09. So they had some weapons, but it could never do anything beyond an early exit in the playoffs. Interesting. Yeah, and I always liked Jeff Fisher. I think he gets a little bit of a bum rap. I mean, he I never really considered him a great head coach, but just from the standpoint of I've sort of heard, heard some interviews with him since he's, re, since he's retired. Seems like a good guy. I don't know. Yeah, I got but, no problems um, with him. Um, and I think yeah, he, yeah. You know, he, he did okay with the Rams, but kind of the same story when he was there. But That yeah. says a lot, though, because if he coached your team for 14 years and never won the big one, the fact that you don't that you still think he's okay means a lot. Because if someone coached the Jets for 14 years and had good teams and never and never won a Super Bowl, I wouldn't be happy. Well, maybe it's just because it's a nondescript franchise like the Titans, right? Where yeah, that's you're true. just kind of like, eh, I mean, hey, we had a good. It was a good Sunday after my college football game on Saturday that I enjoyed. They, you know, they kept it competitive. <laughs> exactly. it was, I hear you. I hear it, you. It passed good the point. time. Fair right? point. I think that's Fair about point. it. But well, what else, Mike? Anything else you want to close it out with? This game was enjoyable and a lot more to it than I expected. I kind of thought I'd say hey, it's going to be a. A quick, uh, quick game and a big play at the end, but otherwise, who really cares? But this is a very, very interesting game and really a crossroads in the NFL as one era is going out and a new era is being ushered in. Yeah, and and then you know now we're used to this early Saturday wild card game being a complete bore, right? I mean, I think it has been for the last maybe decade. Yeah, and this was an early Saturday wild card game between two quality teams that delivered here with not only the storylines, but also how the play ended on the field. And then you had the iconic play to end it. So very pleasant surprise going back and watching this game. It was, it was much more than just that last play. Remember, you can go back and watch the game yourself as it aired on ABC Sports on our website, distantreplaypodcast.com. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and please make sure you subscribe to the podcast. We would really appreciate that. Leave us a review as well. That would also be uh, greatly appreciated. So, Mike, enjoyed it. Uh, very good episode. Lots to talk about, surprisingly, in this game, but I uh, had, uh, had a lot of fun going back and, and reliving this one. Yeah, me as well, man. I'm looking forward to the next one. And, uh, God, these games deliver. Every week they deliver the ones we pick. No doubt. So we look forward to talking to you again next week. Let us know if there's anything you want to listen to us talk about, go back and watch. We'd love to take any of your requests. So hit us up on any of those platforms. We'll be happy to add that to our list of games. We'll be back in another week with another episode. We'll be looking forward to talking to you again here on Distant Replay Podcast.